Arlene Mayerson, Part 1 of 2, Disability Rights Leadership Series, 1999-2000, a project of Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, DREDF, with Access Video, University of San Francisco. In my role as the Directing Attorney at Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, I um, went to Washington, D.C. with Pat Wright in the uh, early 80s to establish a Washington office and we got involved in all the politics that were going on in, the, in Washington and legislation and Supreme Court cases and regulations and so when it came time to do the ADA we were in a position where we had the relationships and the expertise to um, play a leadership role. The ADA, when you look at its history, didn't start in 89 or 88 when it was first introduced, but really started much further back. It really started with the advent of a disability rights movement and disability rights issues becoming part of the national dialogue. And more specifically, in the 80s, um, the work of the disability rights community in Washington in several key pieces of legislation, which enabled the disability community to show its stuff, to show that it um, had political savvy, had a, had the ability to politically organize, it had the ability to negotiate at high levels, um, it had its legal staff in order, and to be able to really have a visibility and a credibility on the Hill. And I don't think that there's any way in the world that in 1988 the disability community could have come forward with a comprehensive civil rights bill and had it even taken the slightest bit seriously if there hadn't been that background for the last 10 years. And that was a lot of hard work and a lot of very, very intense relationship building. The relationships that were most critical, I think, are the relationships we made on the Hill. Um, we, I should probably step back and say a little bit what, about what the pieces of legislation were that we worked on. Um, in the early 80s, when we Dredda first established its office in Washington, D.C., um, the first thing that happened, one of the first things that happened when Reagan came into office was that he established the Bush Task Force on Regulatory Relief. And uh, that was an attempt by a new Republican administration to uh, relieve businesses of some of the burdens that the federal government was placing on them. And in the area of civil rights, they targeted Section 504, which is the predecessor to the ADA. And it was the statute at the time that was known as the Civil Rights Statute for People with Disabilities, or the Declaration of Independence for People with Disabilities, it was actually a statute um, that was somewhat narrow in that it only covered federal financial assistance recipients, but it was the first federal non-discrimination statute. It had extensive regulations that had been worked on by the disability community and by friends that, that the disability community had made um, in Washington. And when the announcement was made that that was going to be a target of deregulation, Dredef was able to come to town and capitalize on the relationships that had been made building the regulation inside the administration and inside the government, and also capitalize on a very vast network of disabled people that it had built across the country through a series of trainings um, on Section 504. So when um, what, when Dredda first came to Washington to fight the deregulation, that was at least from Dredda's point of view when it started laying the groundwork for having the political clout that came 10 years later in the ADA. Pat and I first came to Washington to establish the Washington office. We um, got space from Evan Kemp, and he was running at the time the Disability Rights Center, I think it was called, and he had this two rooms basically, and one big room with a double desk and Pat and I sat on either side of the double desk and he sat in the other room and it was uh, we came there specifically to fight the deregulation well it turns out that his um, bridge partner was Boyden Gray who was the counsel to the vice president and it was the vice president's task force that was deregulating so um, we were able to get access at a very high level to talk to administration officials to say why this was a very poor idea. Um, I think that it was a fantastic entree to have Evan and his relationship with Boyden and what it meant was when, since Boyden was Vice President's 
counsel. It meant that when other people from the White House, from the uh, Department of Justice or from OMB came, they had to bring like-level people. So normally we would have been dealing with just the lowest possible staff person. Um, but instead we were dealing with the highest people in the administration in these various agencies because I think, you know, as a matter of protocol, you don't have Boyd and Gray come to a meeting and then send your little lackey. So we were meeting with Brad Reynolds and very um, high up people at OMB as well. Those meetings were, I think, very successful from a legal kind of argument and negotiation point of view, but I don't think would have um, ended up where we, where we got unless we were also able to show that we had a very big political and community-based network. So the other thing that about those meetings and about what was happening was that nothing had ever been announced. There was no ever any public announcement that there was going to be deregulation. There was certainly no, never any public draft. So the combination was getting things from people in various places um, that we would always know what was going on inside the government because a lot of people had worked for 10 years getting the regulations to begin with. Um, we would get the information. We would send it out to our network in these action alerts. Um, the network would respond tremendously because um, it had just been trained that they had a new right and it was being taken away. It was within a matter of three years. And uh, so when we went to the meetings, it was always with, you know, after this community organizing effort had taken place. And I remember one meeting we went to in particular where they had literally just received 40,000 letters at the White House about a deregulation that had never even been announced. Mm -hmm. So I think it was a very impressive thing. It was also impressive to the civil rights community because this was a time when the civil rights community was being completely closed out and, you know, access was nil. And the disability community was having a lot of access to the administration. Um, so we started to be able to also just make a mark and let it be known that disability wasn't going to be like a side issue or kind of go on everyone's coattails, um, which leads me to the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights. And at the time that we first went there uh, to Washington, the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, which is a very effective and umbrella group for all the civil rights groups and um, variety groups, union groups, et cetera, in D.C., and a very main lobbying arm for civil rights legislation, had a civil rights course task force. And disability was always included, but more as a tag-along item, because the civil rights statutes at the time, um, Section 504 being the disability one, were modeled on uh, t um, Title VI, which covered race discrimination, Title IX, which covered sex discrimination. They all had the exact same wording except for the protected class status. And so anything that happened in this area would, would affect disability. And so it was kind of a tag along issue. Like people from the race and sex communities would go to meetings with important meetings and then, you know, be like, oh yeah, well this covers disability too. Um, I think the biggest change happened there with the advent of the Civil Rights Restoration Act, which was a response to a very negative Supreme Court ruling, which, because the statute said the same things, affected us all equally. Normally, again, what would have happened was, um, you know, representatives from race and sex were very es established and esteemed lawyers, certainly people I like, when Gaga looked up to, um, would have gone to the meetings and by themselves. And um, when we came into town and when we start working on that bill, we wanted to really do our fair share of the work and did our fair share of the work and for that reason I think got included in um, a much more major way. And so because of that we started meeting the people on the Hill that were also the allies of the civil rights community and um, establishing those relationships and at the same time being able to open certain doors that weren't open um, to the civil rights community. Um, and that was a very long fight to get that Civil Rights Restoration Act took several years. And so it was a long time to establish those kind of relationships. Um, and shortly after that, there was a very big, there was a very negative decision involving the rights of kids with disabilities in special education. Smith versus Robinson um, took away the right of parents to recover attorney's fees in those cases. And in that, uh, was another whole um, interesting phenomena because in D.C. 
there was a organization called the um, CCD, actually it was CCDD then, um, Coalition of Citizens, it was Developmental Disabilities and then it changed to Disabilities. Um, that, that coalition had been working on a response to Smith versus Robinson. And we kind of came in and we had uh, wanted to expand what it was that was happening because we wanted to take a very strict civil rights perspective. And this is kind of the whole history generally of the 80s and, and before, which is um, Dreddiff's view that we should just go on the civil rights track. And the traditional way of working on the Hill, which was more of a, you know, something, spe there's always something special about disability. There's always kind of a benefit overlay. Um, and we came in and said, you know, we want at least as much as any other civil rights groups. And no, it's not any different to deny someone, a disabled kid, the right to uh, educational rights. It's not any different than denying someone any other kind of civil right. And that was a new concept because it was all a big challenge to, well, of course it's different because everyone's trying to do their best and for the disabled kid, and if they don't do their best, it shouldn't be treated like a, a someone violated their civil rights. And we said, yeah, let's treat it that way and let's have those kind of rights and remedies attached to it. And in that um, struggle, we made very close relationships with Bobby Silverstein, who at the time was over on the House working for um, Pat, can't remember his name. The head, anyway, the head of the the head of the education committee on the house, Pat Williams, um, and he was working there, and we became we get we we worked very very closely with him to develop the Handicapped Children's Protection Act. Um, he of course then later moved over to the Senate, so he was positioned at the time of the ADA to be the key staff person. But we knew him very well, and we had already established a lot of trust. Because there, um, there was at some point a lot of contention around the Handicapped Children's Protection Act, and he was able to, you know, trust that we would handle the situation both substantively and politically appropriately. Um, the Fair Housing Act was, of course, very important also in terms of really working on a piece of legislation that was a traditional civil rights piece of legislation with the, with the civil rights community, and I think just a tremendous amount of trust had been built by that point, this is the 88, to be able to include disability issues in a traditional civil rights statute. So um, basically, by the time anything was happening with the ADA, there had already been a lot of um, credibility building on the Hill. Not only that, there had also been a lot of wins because um, the Bush Task Force on Regulatory Relief announced that it was it was going to drop its deregulation attempt for 504. Um, oh, I didn't mention the uh, same kind of deregulation attempt was attempted for the special ed law, um, the Education for Handicapped Children Act. That was dropped. We did get the Handicapped Children's Protection Act. We were able to get disability issues in the Fair Housing Act. So there was a lot of wins and there was a lot of credibility. Um, and I remember one late night three o'clock in the morning conversation with Evan Kemp, where he told me that uh, in Washington, you're in as long as you're winning. And so by the time we got to the ADA, we were, we were winning. People want to be in with that. And, um, and of course, this is to say, my, I come from Dreda's point of view, and what we did and what we established, and also this applies in general for the disability community on the Hill by the time the, um, the draft was introduced. So really, when I think about it now, I think I, it's the, uh, I don't know, it's the courage of youth or something, because I was just like gung-ho, ready to do anything. And so when the, when the very first thing, the deregulation um, effort took place, I would go to these meetings, I would be the lead lawyer. And I would be sitting at this meeting with, you know, Brad Reynolds and the head of the Civil Rights Division at Justice and the head of OMB and the head of the White House and all these various people, and I would just be the lead lawyer. And I, I, uh, I don't know. It's just, when I think back on it now, I think it's, it's amazing. 
Um, but at the time, I didn't. I was just like so gung ho into it. But then, you know, I was also in a position where I would go, you know, after the meeting and, you know, write flyers and lick envelopes and Xerox 500 copies of things. And I mean, at that point, everyone, we were just, we did everything there was to do. So I was also just, you know, writing bulletins out to the community and, um, and being with Pat, you know, in terms of figuring out any next move we wanted to make and being involved in kind of as a sounding board for her and also as someone that she could collaborate with and trust. Um, and so that was that. And then when the, when the, um, and I think that I was really doing it very unconsciously. Like I was not very much not aware of, we just kind of would laugh, you know, this is, what are we doing here? It's, but um, then when the Civil Rights Restoration Act happened, the leadership was very much in the women's community primarily, but the women's and, and um, race community, the lawyers were very established in Washington. And I really felt like the best thing I could do was just really work. I worked really hard and just trying to, you know, answer all the memos and do all the theories and the trickle up and the trickle down and, you know, do a lot of work, hard work. And through that hard work, I think Pat and I both got to have more, as I said before, more access to the actual members' meetings and, um, you know, be more in the inner circles and um, disability had been before. But I think it was still definitely more of a, a very secondary role. Very, not for disability though, for disability, it, we were the primary, we were the only people, I think. Um, doing it. I mean, other people, I guess, were involved. I remember having conversations with Tim Cook, and um, certainly Bobby was involved in, on the Hill, but um, we were really trying to represent the disability end of it for that. Um, in the 80s, the other thing that I was very involved with, which I think also contributed some way, in some ways to the political scene, is that I took it upon myself at Dredov to be coordinating Supreme Court efforts. And so when the cases that went to before the Supreme Court, um, several of them did, I would try to get involved with the person whose case it was, who would be arguing the case, as well as trying to coordinate amicus briefs. And so I got very, very involved in that process. And that was also, I think, helped in terms of elevating our national status and also our status as a legal organization that could do good legal work. Um, and that was like a defense fund. First time I actually started to work on the ADA was there was a meeting at the National, we used to have offices at the National Women's Law Center. And there was a meeting at the National Women's Law Center where we had the ADA as it had been introduced in 88. And the idea was can we make this into a politically viable piece of legislation that could actually pass? Disability Rights Leadership Series, 1999-2000. Producer, Phyllis Ward, Access Video. Interviewers, Phyllis Ward and Mary Lou Breslin. Post-production, editing, captions, audio description, Dave Newell. Stewardship, promotion, distribution. Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund. Mary Lou Breslin, Susan Henderson. Special thanks goes to both the sung and the unsung heroes who worked tirelessly to make the Americans with Disabilities Act a reality. The Disability Rights Leadership Series owes a debt of gratitude to the individuals who agreed to be interviewed and without whose passion and dedication the ADA would not have become law. The series would not have come about without the vision of Pat Wright, the longtime Director of Governmental Affairs for DREDF, and Arlene Mayerson, DREDF's Directing Attorney, who conceptualize the series and the interview themes. Thanks goes to the University of San Francisco for sponsoring the project that included the Disability Rights Leadership Series, and the Bancroft Library, University of California, Berkeley, for accepting an archival copy of the unedited interviews and providing a safe and permanent home for the collection. The series would not have been possible without funding from the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. A list of the interviewees and links to their interviews can be found at dreadf.org. 2015.